prayer. Today, we celebrate the legacy of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr.'s leadership of the modern American Civil Rights Movement was from December 1955 until April 4, 1968. African Americans achieved more genuine progress to a racial equality in America than the previous 350 years had produced. Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, Nobel Peace Prize lecture and letter from a Birmingham jail are among the most perverted orations and writers in the English language. His accomplishments are now taught to American children of all races, and his teachings are studied by scholars and students worldwide. He is the only non-president to have a national holiday dedicated in his honor, and is the only non-president mem memorized on the Great Mall in the nation's capital. He is memorized in hundreds of statues, parks, streets, squares, churches, and other public facilities around the world as a leader whose teachings are relevant to the progress of humankind. He went on to lead similar campaigns against poverty and international conflict, always maintaining fidelity to his principles that men and women everywhere, regardless of color or creed, are equal members of the human family. Thank you, Ms. Evans. And now let us prepare for the call to worship. I'm sorry. I'll make this very brief. Good morning, Blue Mitch Good morning. I'd like to reemphasize our men's day effort uh, for this year. Our theme this year is Men of Gold, acknowledging his grace, his mercy, his favor. Our speaker for the event will be. Reverend Romano Brady, Steel Creek Community Baptist Church, I thank you in advance for your support. All ads will be due on January the 29th. I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Now let us prepare for the call to worship. Let us stand. Blessed be the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Praise be to God, the giver of many gifts. Our help is in God's hand, the one who calls us here. Amen. You may be seated.
scripture for this morning is found in the Old Testament book of Exodus, the 17th chapter, and the reading will begin with the 8th verse. When you have it, say amen. Amen. If you're still looking, we give you a moment to moisten your finger and find your way. Amen. King James Version presents it, starting with verse 8, in this manner. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, and Call the name of it Jehovah Nisi. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. I have read for your hearing from the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus, verses 8 through 16. This is God's word and it is for God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Clothes in the right mind. Yes, yes, yes. 
Lord, we're standing here saying thank you. Thank you. For it had not been for you, where would we be? Lord, we thank you for what you did in the preacher's life. I had to go to the doctor and they found some more But Lord, we know that thou art God who can fix anything. The doctors could not find any more things in my body and said, you're 76 years old. In five more years, you'll be 81 and you won't have to worry about it. I just stand to say that God, the God I serve, has no ability, has the ability to keep me as long as he wants me. Yeah. And all of us, yeah. one man can't say where I'm at. Lord, bless our sick and shitty. And let them know that you're still right there by their side. Bless our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. And let them know that there is somebody else other than man that is in charge of this world. And his name is Jesus. Continue to bless our past and his wife. Continue to give them strength. And let them know that no matter what comes their way, that the Lord will, the Lord has. And he will continue to make ways out of no way. Somebody needs you this morning. Somebody got up sick this morning. But Lord, we know thou is a healer of all manner of disease. And then Lord, look at our world. All tore up again. But Lord, we know that you can touch the hearts of anybody and make it all right. We thank you for who you are, what you've done in our lives, and what you continue to do in our lives. And we give you praise and glory in Jesus' precious name. This is our prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Blessed Holy Ghost, we pray it all. And the Lord. 
King James presents it in this format. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Using these words as text, I want to talk with you for a little while from the theme, the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that you have given us to draw together. We ask, Lord, that right now you would let us open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts to your word, and that we would encourage one another as we walk together, children of the Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 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 The battle is the Lord. As we began to look in the book of Exodus, we see where the children of Israel had been a difficult group. You know, we think about our children today, and many of us have had challenges working with them and encouraging them and directing them and doing all the things that we felt necessary to make them to be the best that we could. But we see here in this story that not only had the children of Israel tried Moses, but they had also tried God. And regardless of what transpired, the Lord was always there to take care of them and to enable them to overcome the difficulties and the adversities that they encountered. But I want to tell you about a time when things got difficult once again for the children of Israel. You know, the Lord had fed them when they were hungry. Mm -hmm. The Lord had given them water when they were thirsty. And now they had a enemy. The Bible says they were called the Amalekites. The Amalekites were considered to be the staunch enemies of the Israelites. But you see, there's something that the Bible doesn't say specifically. You have to look in the history, and there you will see that the people of the Amalekites were the grandson, and those generations of Esau. Therefore, he was actually a cousin of the Israelites. But you know, there is problems in the family from time to time that things don't work out. We don't do what somebody says, then they take their family and they go home. But they were considered now to be staunch enemies of the Israelites. 
History tells us that the Amalekites harassed Hebrews during the Exodus from the time they left Egypt all the way until they got to Rephidim, which is near Mount Sinai. The Bible tells me that the Amalekites lived in the desert south of Canaan somewhere around Kaddish, in the northern part of the Negev. Amalek was the son of Eliphaz by a concubine named Timnah, and he became chief in the tribe of Esau. Thus the Amalekites were family, should have been working together should have been encouraging the Israelites because the Israelites had no intention nor desire to do anything negative, had not even begun because they were more concerned with eating, drinking, and getting out of the desert. But the Amalekites didn't like the fact that they were anywhere close to what they considered to be their territory. These distant cousins to the Israelites, they probably knew about the promise of the land of Canaan that had been given to Esau's twin brother Jacob. Therefore, they should not have felt any threat to their interest in the Negev. Had this promise been remembered and taken seriously, but you know, when folk don't want to follow God, mm -hmm. they go where they want to go. They do what they want to do. They say what they want to say. And they'll attack anybody that they don't like. Well. Nevertheless, there was a promise made. The promise was to be a means of blessing. Not only to the Israelites, but to the Amalekites along with all the other nations. For in Genesis 12 and 3, the word says, I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. That's what God's word said to the children of Israel. The Amalekites began to assault the Israelites. And because they did this, they drew the anger of God on two counts. They failed to recognize the hand and plan of God in Israel's life and destiny. And the first targets of their warfare were the ones who were sick who were on their way to the promised land, the ones who were aged, couldn't walk fast, the ones who were tired, having traveled so long through the desert, through the hot desert, they couldn't go very fast, very far, and the Amalekites would attack those who lagged behind the line of march. Thus, Amalek became the first among the nations to attack Israel. But Moses chose to commission a young man about 45 years old whose name initially was Moshe, the son of Nun, who later was renamed Joshua. He was to muster an army to fight against the Amalekites. While Moses, with the staff of God that he had, that had divided the water in the Red Sea and closed the water in on the enemy, that staff in his hand would stand on top of a nearby hill overlooking the plain. It was important to know that it took both elements. They were to be operating the sword in Joshua's hand and the staff, a symbol of divine intervention, in Moses' hand. 
divine sovereignty and human responsibility were linked in carrying out the will of God. My brothers and sisters, can you imagine what it was like for the children of Israel as they were making their way and being attacked from the rear by their enemy? But, but Moses told Joshua, we're going to take care of this. And I want you to get an army. Get some men together. They didn't say how many men there were. They didn't say the numbers, but who knows what the actual numbers were, but these were men who had God's will and God's heart in mind. The Bible says they began to get the men together, and as they began to go to war with the Amalekites, that, that Moses also went up on a high hill. He and Aaron and Ur went there. The Bible says they began to have a battle. The battle was taking place and Joshua and his men were fighting intensely. But there was something special taking place. For as long as Moses was able to hold his hands up with the staff in his hand that the children of Israel, the Hebrews, were able to be secure.